All right, this, this is how they're setting out the balloons. They're getting ready to set out the search lines. And um, there's a cinder block on the bottom of each one of these. So this diver will bring it out. He's not the main diver because he's just got a small pony bottle on. So he's just going to bring out and set the search lines. And um, then they'll begin the search. Yeah, basically, you know, like I said before, it's all done by feel. This is a magnetometer doing an in the uh, close search of the shoreline, okay? And it's got a round, for those of you who are treasure hunters or who go on to the, you know, look for magnetic things in your yard, you know, magnetometer has a small magnetic head. This is the battery pack with the, uh, the finite adjustments for the squelch and for the uh, sensitivity. And there's a bone phone that you put up right on your mastoid process that just vibrates your head all the time and you can hear this buzzing in your ears. So this is basically an inshore search. Uh, this is the same type of device that would be on your person hanging without the, uh, without the metal handle. The head comes off, you hold the head, and the main device is attached to your, to your body. All right, uh, search equipment. I mean, metal detectors, side scan sonars, um, drop video, remotely operated vehicles, search lines, floats, anchoring devices, search tools. Every diver that, that I would send down would have two important tools. They have a, uh, a metal shear cutting scissor and a knife that has a serrated, no tip, but a serrated edge that could cut metal, fish line, things like that, because you're constantly becoming entangled when you're crawling across the bottom in these areas. Because everybody that, that has a canal or a lake by their house, I guarantee you, maybe not you because you're all nice people, but I guarantee you some of your friends may have disposed of some unwanted things in this lake. Uh, you know, God only knows what you find in these lakes and, and the streams and the rivers. But, you know, we have a lot of fishermen. You know, you're under there, you have people, what happens when you get snagged? You cut the line. What happens when the hooks get tied up? You cut the line. So, I mean, these things are all down there and they're all impediments to your progress. So you need to be able to cut yourself free or else you'd be wasting so much time having somebody come down, cut you loose, come back up, start the search again. You have to be pretty self-sufficient down there uh, to make sure that you can, in, you know, de-entangle yourself. You have to basically rescue yourself, you know, unless something, you know, catastrophic fails and you need help, but you, you pretty much are on your own. Uh, the most important device right here, the metal, metal detector, that is the bread and butter of any uh, underwater search and recovery team. Uh, that is the most helpful device that you can possibly use and um, it, it works extremely well. I was telling somebody before that when we used to train, uh, we would black out the masks and we'd, give the, uh, we'd throw a handful of pennies into a reservoir and we'd send the new guys in and say, okay, fine. When you, get, when you find 10 cents, come on out. And they have to find 10 pennies with the magnetometer. Well, they finally started getting smart and they had like 20 cents of change in their pocket, you know. <laughs> After the second dive, yay, 20 cents, I got it. You know, but then we changed the, uh, <laughs> the type of coins and they didn't know which ones we were going to use that particular day. But um, the, be the best thing right here, there's some limited applications for side scan, limited applications for drop videos, but all of these things are the tools that will utilize and help prevent injury to the diver. It'll help your search. It'll help with the safety aspects and factors that you have to deal with all the time. This is what side scan looks like, okay? Side scan sonar. Uh, it's a great device. Um, you know, it, it's basically uh, sonar, but you can pull this from the back of a boat at, at slow speeds, and you get great resolution with this. You know, that's a boat on the bottom. Uh, magnetometer in use in the Bahamas or somewhere that they don't need it. I mean, I don't know what he's looking for, maybe treasure, but he's not looking for evidence in this. Uh, here's the magnetometer that we underwater to use. Typically, you find guns with this. This is the drop video, ROV. These are great if you don't want to send a diver down. You can send one of these down and get a good video back to the surface and see exactly what they're going to be swimming into. Psychological effects. You're dealing with zero visibility. You're dealing with vulnerability to stress. You're dealing with the macho person we hit on. The state of the diver themselves, what kind of state of mind are you in the day of the dive? Stressors, not being able to see in the dark, in the cold. Impaired functions, when stress takes over, unforeseen events and panic, when stress takes over, there's a whole study uh, of stress and the effects of stress on divers. And when stress takes over, you know, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. It can really end up badly for the diver. But these are all things that you're going to get when you have black water diving. These are cumulative. You should debrief the divers all the time uh, and don't make little of these things that, he, that the diver would say because they're real to that diver at that time. You know, and it's very important to make sure that they're in a good state of mind before they go into black water. Uh, that's, that's the last slide, but I wanted to bring out, uh, I was thinking on the way up, and I should have put one more slide in, but 
Special Operations and post 9-11. Now, Special Operations are, are far above the basic uh, underwater crime scene investigation. Special Operations like TWA-800, the plane that crashed in, in Long Island Sound, okay? These are, are potential crime scenes, but these are scenes that you have to work. Very different type of training, very different environments. Uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger that went down in, in the lake in Texas when it blew up, we went out there, we were recovering astronauts, you know, and, and, and pieces of the Challenger. Uh, these are very special events, very special types of, of training you need. Uh, it's a very different circumstance. The anthrax case a few years ago where the, um, the professor that was an anthrax researcher was weaponizing it and he threw all of this stuff in a lake in Maryland. Now this is another very special type of uh, event that you have to deal with uh, as far as the hazard. You're dealing with anthrax. Um, the Atlanta Olympic bombing. We, uh, we did a lot of the searches of the pavilions on the, uh, on the lake and where the, the water shows were going to be uh, after the bombing. We, you know, they wanted everything searched. They wanted you know, it done yesterday. The value jet that crashed in the Everglades just after 9-11, that was an unbelievable. They had to go out in the airboats to, to get to the site, and in the Everglades, it's just, it's an incredible uh, jungle of things, animals, snakes, uh, crocod alligators, you know, and, and just another dynamic of what a large uh, event scene could be for you. The USS Cole, we had our guys go over when the coal got, uh, got blown up. There was an unbe unbelievable crime scene, a bomb crater under the boat, 10 or 15 feet under the water. You know, that was uh, another specialized area and type of crime scene that you had to deal with. We, I had a case, this is, believe it or not, because you see all this lovely aquatic aquaculture that are in the museums here and that people have in their aquariums. Well, in South Florida, they grow this stuff. It's called aquaculture. And there's aquaculture zones that are specifically set out by the Department of Interior off the Keys. So you have people that get a large amount of um, debris, cinder block, building material, soil, and they dump it on their plot that they rent from the government. And basically, after four or five years, there's a good strata and, and base mat for the uh, coral to grow on. It accelerates the growth rate. Then they sell, harvest, and sell to the museums and aquariums. Somebody was stealing. You know, somebody's come along with a backhoe and just taking a chunk out of this mountain of rubble with the coral on it and moving it to their mountain of rubble. I still really didn't quite get the, uh, <laughs> the concept with the rubble moving, but, you know, so we went down and did a whole underwater examination of it. And, but you never know what, what you're going to get, and especially in a post-9-11 environment. I mean, nobody would thought we would be doing hull searches of, of cruise ships and container ships before 9-11. Nobody thought we would have to, you know, go through specialized training with the Navy to identify, you know, Limus mines. Uh, it, it, it just brought in a whole new dimension to, uh, to the public safety dive role that we have to deal with now. But um, that's the environment that we live in, and hopefully I was, at, I was at warp speed going through this. I'm sorry, but we were a little bit limited on time. And I thank you for your attention, and hopefully, um, you know, you learned something tonight. If you need to get a hold of me, you can just refer to the first slide. And thank you very much to the panel.